Amen. Uh, by the way, Pastor Renee last week told you about the baskets. Remember all the baskets and the containers? If you look up here, here are some of them. We're not ready to, we're not ready to sell them yet because we're using them. Um, these are the t-shirts and there are more over there. But Marcy, wave your hand. She's, she's shy. The baskets are from her, Miss Marcy. Miss Mark. Ah, so there are many, many, many more. So we invite you after the service, go up on the third floor and you can look at, there are walls of baskets. We've taken them out of the, the uh, boxes now. So, <laughs> amen. Amen. And now let's turn to the word of God. Okay? Amen. amen. That's right. Let me take my watch off. Um, last week was Pentecost Sunday. I wasn't here. I was in the Philippines. You all were here and you were studying the uh, book of Leviticus. And um, I'm actually halfway through a message about the church. God is building his church, how he does it. But I'm not going to continue with that this morning. Instead, we are going to honor the Holy Spirit and His work this morning. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, even though Pentecost Sunday is one week past, I'm back now. And since Pastor Renee has been teaching on Leviticus, and I'm prepared um, because I've been teaching on the Holy Spirit, I, I love to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I love I love and I love water baptism too. There's some things that I, I really I really love it. Some of my favorite things, but I love to talk about um, I love to talk about the Holy Spirit. A few years ago, um, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit as a child, um, but a few years ago, I, I shared with some with some people. I began praying because I would often talk about the Holy Spirit and I would often pray for people for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I didn't have a lot of faith or confidence that when I preached and when I prayed that God was really going to do something. And so I really began to pray, not, not for my sake, but for, but for people that I pray, pray for or that I, preach, that, I, that I preach to. I said, Lord, I, I want to grow in this area. I want to understand more about your spirit. Lord, when I pray for people, I want to believe and I want to have the confidence that you're going to do something. You're going to baptize people with your spirit. And I really began to pray. And it was just in this last year or so, um, I was thinking about it when we were in Elo Elo. And I know it's not me because I know, I know it's, the, it's the work of God. But the Lord sort of brought to mind, remember you prayed about this. And I thought, Lord, you're answering that prayer. It was so 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 encouraging to see people open their hearts to the Holy Spirit their lives to the Holy Spirit and to see him do what only he can do nobody can baptize you in the Holy Spirit except God the Father and Jesus the Son they they do it you hear all sorts of unusual teachings you see all sorts of usual unusual things that's a great reminder turn off your phones put them on silent here at the beginning there we go um, and so I'd like to, to teach, and we want to talk for a while about the Holy Spirit this morning. And we're just going to look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. We hear all sorts of strange things and teachings about the Holy Spirit, don't we? All sorts of strange things. We sometimes see all sorts of weird manifestations, yes or no? Yes, we do. How many of you, thank you, another reminder, Okay, take just a minute, check your phones one more time. Okay, I'll give you just a second. Yeah, two in a row. This means the enemy wants to distract us. Thank you, Miss Amy. There you go. Please silence your cell phones. Thank you. Honestly, I, the enemy wants to distract because the Holy Spirit is so important in our lives. So let's go back to, we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. We see things that are weird sometimes and that are strange sometimes. And we get turned off, don't we? We get a little bit scared. We think, oh, no. What I want to say is this this morning. People are sometimes weird and strange. Yes. The Holy Spirit, who is God, is never weird or strange, okay? One more time. The Holy Spirit is God. People are sometimes strange or weird. Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is never 
strange or weird. Never. He is God. He is God. We won't get to it this morning, but He is in nature and in character. He is the nature and character of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said when He was teaching. He said, I'm going to send one. So Jesus had something to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And He also said, I will return to heaven and I will ask the Father, and He will send. So sent of the Father, sent of Jesus, and Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, I will send another comforter. You've heard me talk about this before. That word another means someone, another one like me. Not just another one, but another one like me. So in character, in nature, in action, in goal, in heart, the Holy Spirit is like Jesus. Who's afraid of Jesus? Who thinks Jesus is weird or strange? None of us do. Jesus was so, to, when we think about him, when we read about him, so lovely, so winsome, so appealing, so appealing. That is the character and nature of the Holy Spirit. So we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, when people talk about the Holy Spirit or teach about the Holy Spirit, they focus only on one thing. And we are a Spirit-filled church. We are a, if you want to say Pentecostal, you can use that word. Or if you want to say charismatic, you can use that word. Or a full gospel, we, hear, we say all sorts of things. But we, I sometimes hear people talk about the Holy Spirit or teachings, and they only talk about one thing. Have you ever heard this before? And they only talk about tongues, 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 tongues. Have you ever heard that? Speak in tongues, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. Or they talk about power, 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 power. That's part of the Holy Spirit, right? That is part of the Holy Spirit's work. Or the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12. The gifts of the Spirit. Oh, the gift of this and the gift of that. And that's what they focus on. I don't think that's the right way to talk about the Holy Spirit. I don't think that brings honor to the Holy Spirit who is God. Let me give you an example. What if I were to talk about Sylvia? Okay, my friend Sylvia here. And somebody says, right here, Sylvia is right next to Lauren. Wave your hand, Miss Sylvia. Okay, there's Miss Sylvia right there. Sylvia's wondering, what am I going to say? But, so I want to talk about Sylvia. And I, and I say, oh, have you met my friend Sylvia? Have you met my friend Sylvia? And let's see. And so I describe her and I say, um, oh, Oh, her hair. Her hair is so nice. Her hair is so nice. Have you met my friend Sylvia? Oh, she has really nice hair. And, and oh, I really like her. Her hair is so nice. Have you met my, my friend Sylvia? Oh, her hair. It's really great hair. She has really great hair. How strange would that be? The only thing I'm saying about Sylvia is her hair, her hair, her hair. Right? But Sylvia is a whole person, isn't she? She has a personality. She has many, many parts to her that make up the whole person. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit, isn't it? He is more than just a tongue. He helps us to speak in the language of heaven that God gives us. He is more than power. He is more than His gifts. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit is complete. And when we come to the Holy Spirit, we want to know about Him and understand Him in the way that we understand Jesus, in the way that we understand God the Father. We need to understand all about Him. So we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. Where would we begin? A lot of people would go to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were gathered in the upper room and suddenly came the rushing wind. But that's not where we begin with the Holy Spirit. Some people would say, oh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of the Spirit. I want those powerful gifts. But that's not where the Holy Spirit starts. Let's instead go back to the very beginning. The very beginning, really the beginning. If you have your Bibles, you could open them to Genesis 1-1. And we read in Genesis 1-1 at the very beginning, although of course God has always been, so God was before Genesis 1-1. We read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now stay with me for a little, stay with me and focus. I want us to see something this morning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the opening of the inspired word of God. 
And these first few words, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. And then chapters 1, 2, and 3 tell us about how God created, about the beginning. And we read in Acts 4, 24, and 25, but the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God, and they said, O oh, Sovereign Lord, that's God the Father, okay? God the Father, creator of heavens and earth, the sea, and everything in them. So who do we see in the beginning? We see God the Father. God the Father. He's there in the beginning of creation. Now, what comes next? Let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. And what do we see in John 1.1? 1, 1? By the way, Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1 are companion chapters. I, I encourage you sometime, read Genesis 1.1 1, 1, and then uh, read Genesis 1, read John 1. The parallels are beautiful. They're wonderful. And so Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning God talks about sovereign God. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was, oh, it sounds like Genesis again, doesn't it? In the beginning was what? The Word. The Word. It's capitalized. Who is the Word? Jesus. God the Son. Jesus. The Word is, is, an, is an expression, right? If I want to communicate with you, now I can look at you, I can wink, and I can do those things, but, but the most common way people communicate is how? Through words. I express myself to you through words, and then you understand what's in my heart. Yeah? You understand what I'm going to say. And so I can say, good morning. I can say, God bless you. I love you. I care about you. And I'm expressing, and then you understand something about me, and we have communication. Here's this beautiful beginning in John where the Holy Spirit inspires in the beginning was the Word. And so we see the Word is Jesus. Why doesn't John just say in the beginning was Jesus? Why, why doesn't he say that? Because it is Jesus. Yes. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. So people who say Jesus is less than God you will sometimes meet cults and people who will say, well, he was the son of God. He wasn't really God. He wasn't really divine. You go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Why doesn't John say in the beginning was Jesus? He wants us to see something. In the beginning was the word. And here is this picture to help you and me understand. Jesus the expression of God. How is God the Father, the sovereign God, how is He going to communicate with humans? How is He going to reveal Himself to men and women? How is He going to show you and me? How is, how is He going to show us what He is like, how He loves us, what His heart is? He's going to do it through Jesus. He's going to do it through Jesus. That is one of the reasons Jesus came to earth. That's one of the reasons he took on flesh. If this spirit floated around the world and it was Jesus, how would that help us? It would help us a little bit, but you and I would think, but I'm not like that. He's not like me. I can't really relate to that. I can't really relate. Jesus took flesh the flesh that you have, the flesh that I have, the body that gets tired, the body that is weak sometimes, the heart that is full of emotion, the heart that gets disappointed, the heart that is broken, the heart that grieves when a loved one dies like Lazarus and Jesus wept. He took on flesh. He became like us. Why? so that we could know what God the Father is like. And God the Father expressed Himself fully through Jesus. Remember what, um, I think it was Nathaniel. I, don't, I think it was Nathaniel, the disciple. Remember what he said to Jesus? He said, Master, show us the Father. And you remember what Jesus said? If you have seen me, 
You've seen the Father. You've seen the Father. So people who tell you, oh, I don't know about God. God is hard. Have you ever had people tell you that? I have. God, I can't. He's, he's very demanding. He's so, but Jesus, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Perfect harmony. Perfect union. The same in character. The same in nature. The same love that Jesus had for people. The same heart for people. That's God the Father. That's God the Father. Do you see that? So that's why it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The expression of God that you and I can understand that we can relate to. God speaks your language. God speaks my language. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. By the way, <clears throat> if I were marking this as an English teacher when I used to grade things, when I used to teach writing, you know what I would say at this point? Too repetitive. I would say that. I would say, I would say you've made the point, keep on going. I, this, that's what I used to teach writing and grammar. And that's what I would say when you're, when you're writing your essays. Too repetitive, right? Sure. Do you think God doesn't know how to write? <laughs> of course he does. What is God doing here? He's repeating himself. This is important, isn't it? He wants us to know. He wants us to get it. God the Father knew that there would be cults and people who would say, Jesus isn't God. Jesus was, was this. He was something else. And God the Father wants us to know. God the Son is God from the beginning. He was there. Now, look with me at verse 3. You'll see which way I'm going in just a minute. Verse 3. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. We, we get that, don't we? So, and you'll see other verses in the New Testament. So in the beginning, God the Father is there. In the beginning, God the Son is there. Where's the Holy Spirit? Genesis 1, 2. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And what do we read now? What does it say? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was hovering over the waters. I love this picture. Don't you? I love this picture. Here is this. It's not a world yet. There are no people yet. It's formless. There's nothing there that you can say this is a form. There's nothing there that is creative. There's no light. It's darkness. Now, we'll come to, back to this a little bit later, but I want to, I want to make the point right now because we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. When this says, I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I can study English, okay? Now, the earth was formless and empty. Do you know what this word means right here in the original, in the original Hebrew? It does not mean that God made it that way. Would God ever make something formless, empty, dark, just a, a, a mess of things? Would God do that? No. God makes all things beautiful. God makes all things well. So this is kind of mysterious, but it points to some things maybe that came before the Bible. We don't know. We don't know. So I'm not preaching a doctrine, but it says this actually means the earth became became formless and empty. And so a lot of Bible scholars who are way smarter than I am believe that this came because of sin. That when Satan rebelled against God in heaven and he was cast out of heaven, that this was the result of the fall of Satan and his angels, the rebellious angels that became demons, that fought, that rebelled against God and then were cast out of heaven. So that's what they think. So this is what we see here. The Bible doesn't tell us, so you can't say, that's what it is, but that's what I think. That's what it seems to be. Now I want you to see this. God the Father is there. God the Son is there. God the Spirit is there. And I want you to focus on God the Spirit right here. Because here we have a picture. It's not clearly said, but I think we can see the picture. 
What is there has no purpose at this point. What is there is formless. What is there is useless. What is there is unproductive. What is there has no life and no light. And the Spirit of God hovers over it. God will never be satisfied when His creation is not good, is not right, is not productive, is not bringing glory to Him. We see it in the beginning. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And that gives me hope for men and women, for you and me. God the Spirit, in the same way as in creation, when He comes into your life, before you know Him, before you knew Him, before you were aware of Him, the Holy Spirit saw you. The Holy Spirit knew before you had come to God. This man, this woman, her life, his life, it is not in the image of God. It is not productive. There's no life there. There's no light there. What God had made, what God had planned, it's not seen in this life. And the Holy Spirit of God will not rest, is not content with death and darkness and chaos and disorder. He comes into our lives when you and I say, when you and I say, whatever prayer you prayed from your heart, it may have been, oh God, help. How many of you prayed a prayer like that when you came to God? It wasn't very eloquent, was it, Jackie? Oh God, help. But God speaks your language. And He knew what you meant when you said, oh God, help. He read all into it. He knew exactly what it was. He knew that Jackie was saying, my life is a mess. Oh God, I need you. Come into my life. Change me. Give me your life. Take away my sins. Make me new. What happens? You may have had a very eloquent prayer. You may have stood and prayed a sinner's prayer. God knows our hearts. And when you did, the Holy Spirit of God who was there in creation is there in creation in your life too and in my life. And He comes in and He brings life and He regenerates and He takes what is useless to God. He takes a life with very little purpose. He takes a life that is broken and torn and full of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness. And He comes in and He does what only God, the Holy Spirit, can do. Church cannot change your life. Religion cannot change your life. Theology cannot change your life. It takes His life to give you life. It takes His life to take away your death. It takes His light to remove the darkness in your life. It takes His perfect form and creation to remake our broken lives. Brothers and sisters, this is why we must speak not our church, not religion, not good deeds. We must speak Jesus. We must show Jesus. We must display Jesus. He makes the difference. So we go back to creation. And there's the parallel here, as we see, in creation and in our lives. God the Father is there. God the Son is there. God the Holy Spirit is there. And they're all involved in creation. 
And then God speaks. And whatever He speaks comes into being. What does God say first? Let there be light. So if you go back and read John chapter 1, you will see the same thing. The light shined in darkness. Okay, you'll see the same thing. It's a really beautiful when you see the two fitting together. God speaks, let there be light. And what happens? <laughs> there was light. If God says it, it will be. Does that encourage you? It encourages me. If God says it, it's truth. It will be. And there was light. And then, let there be this. And then he divides. And then he says, let there be this. And it is. And let there be dry land. And let there be these animals. And let there be the creatures of the sea. And everything that God says is. And then we come to day six. Now some of you are saying, are we really going to get to the Holy Spirit? This is part of it. This is part of it. Then we come to day six. And what do we see? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now I want you to stop there for just a second before we, go, before we add another verse. I want you to see something. God is still creating, but now God begins to do something different. There is no other part of God's creation where God said, let me make this creation like myself. Let me, let me make this creation in my image. Brothers and sisters, as wonderful as they are, as human as they appear at times, God never said of great apes, of chimpanzees, of, of gorillas, of whatever, though they can be taught sign language and things like that. And they are wonderful. It is a wonderful part of God's creation. But God did not say, I make that in my image, no matter what science says. And there are things that we don't know and we don't understand. But of only one thing in creation did God say, I will make this, let us make this in our own image. And that was what? Mankind. Man and woman. He made us in his image. Now God says, let us. Why does God say let us? Why does God say let us? Why? We are three. God the Father. God the Son. God the Spirit. Perfect harmony, perfect unity, all working together. Let us make man in our own, own image. And he makes man. So here's the first difference we see in creation. But it's not the only difference. It's not the only difference. Let's look at what we see next. And I love this. Genesis 2, 7. We have more details. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Okay? Now, let's stop there for just a second. He formed the man out of the dust from the ground. And I want you to see something here. I, I love this. I love this. We see God. Now, does God have hands? No. God is a spirit. But God uses words. He inspires this so we can understand God's heart. What does this look like to you? Then the Lord God formed the man. Does this say... The Lord God said, and then the Lord said, let there be man. Is that what it says? No. 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 What is the picture that we get here? We get the picture of creation. We get the picture of physical activity, don't we? When we read this, we see, I don't know about you, let me tell you what I see. I see what I think God wants us to see, not that he did it this way because he's God, but to help us understand, can you see God taking hands and scooping down with the dust and God formed, yes? Just as he did Eve, Adam and Eve. He, he took the rib, but from the dust as well, God formed. We see something different here. And I, I want you to see that because we live in many societies that don't value human life, that don't see man in the image of God. And here we have this beautiful picture of how God values you and me, of how God values men and women. It's a personal thing. It's not, and God said, let there be light. 
we, we think of that, don't we? And there was light, okay? Instead, we see a personal God, a God that's intimate. It's an intimate creation. He kneels, he takes dust from the earth, and he forms. This word formed is a word that has to do with creation, and it is a technical word that is used to describe making pottery. How many of you have made pots before? If you've made pottery before, maybe some of you had. It, and it, it takes your hands, doesn't it? It takes the pressure of the potter. It takes movement. It takes the idea. It takes the creativity to make that. And that's what we see. The Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground. He formed to make it like himself. It, and so it's implied this. And then look at the, the next one. That's why in Psalm 139, when, when you think about in the womb, when there is a child, when, when there's a child that's conceived in the room, womb, do you know that exactly the same word is used in the Bible and outside of the Bible? Formed has to do with the moment, the moment of conception. When the egg and the sperm meet, conception, from the moment of conception, it's the same word, formed. God is involved in birth. God is involved in conception. That's why people who say, well, it's just some cells, it's just a thing, they don't understand how God looks at life. They don't understand how God sees what he is creating. So it's exactly the same thing. This, and this, these are the same words that are used here. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my what? Unformed, Unformed body. Because God knows what will be. God has a plan for that egg and that sperm that have come together to bring new life into the world. God sees it. It is a being. It is a person. So it's the same word. Now, we go back. Let's look at the next slide. He formed man out of the dust from the ground. Now, before we add anything else, I want to ask you something. Uh, David. May I use you as an example? I'm going to do it because he's a guy. David, I hate to do this to you, but would you just lie down right here? I know it's going to be. Just lie down. Just lie down. Do the best you can with the camera, okay? Don't move because you're not alive yet, okay? Don't even smile, okay? So, God forms, you can stand up if you want to, but David's lying very still. He's a form. He looks like a man, but there's no life yet. He is only dust. Is there a shape? There's a shape. But there's no life. There's no life. There's an image there, but there's not yet life. And so God has formed him. God has formed him. And then Genesis 2-7 Look at what comes next. We see what? The next part of the slide. He took him from the dust. He made from the dust of the ground. Then what does God do? He breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. What happens when God breathes life? What happens? Man became a living being. A living being. Okay, you're going to live, right? Okay, we breathe. And man became a living being. He, he became alive. He could move. There was something there now. He was no longer just a form. He was now alive. Thank you, David. I know he didn't want to do that, but he was so obedient. Thank you, David. That's a good example. He became a living being. Now, I want us to see that in creation because it helps us to understand what God does in our lives. Do you see that? He took from the dust because we are of this earth. But brothers and sisters, we are more than of this earth. We are more than of this world because God said, let us make man in our own image and like ourselves. And then he breathed the breath of life into that dust that had been formed. And what happened? He gave life. And that, that form became alive. What was lifeless became alive. That's what God did in making men and women, in making you and me in the beginning. 
and man became a living being. Now I want you to see something. Because we are of this world, but we are of more than this world because God has made us in his image. That's why everyone matters to God. The worst of the worst matter to God. The poorest of the poor matter to God. The most broken of the broken, the, the, the most forgotten of the forgotten, the weakest of the weak, they matter to God because they are made in the image of God and God has given them of his life. Man became a living being. Where did the life come from that came into man? You tell me. Where did it come from? It came from God. It was God life that brought life to man. It was God life, and he became a living being. It wasn't just a natural life, although there was natural life. It says he breathed into him the breath of life, okay? A little more, a little more background in the original, the tri actually, this is not just life. This means the breath of lives, plural, okay? That word is a plural word, although they don't write it that way. It's a plural word, the breath of lives. So, God gave man more than one type of life. More than one type of life. God gave man physical life, body, because we are of this world and we live in this world. So physical life, God gave him. What other type of life do we have? There is another part of us. There is a soulish part that's another type of life because I look at you, um, but you are more than your body, aren't you? You're part of this world, but if I only describe you in terms of your body, I miss part of you. I miss the most important part of you the more important part of you, because you are personality, you are emotions, you are will. So there's that other part of you that's another type of life that you have. And with that life, you know yourself, you are self-aware. And with that life, you also relate to people. That's the relationship with other people. So there's the body, physical life. There's the soulish part of you, that that is part of life, but there's another part of you as well. And what is it? Because God said, let us make man like ourselves. God is a trinity. God the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So what else does he give us? What other type of life did he give Adam and Eve? One more type of life. Spirit life. Spiritual life. And I want you to think about it. I've st for me, I've started thinking about it in another way. I've almost stopped saying spirit life. And you know what I've started saying and said? Because this is what it is. He gives man and woman God life. Because it comes from Him. It is His life. It is holy life. It is eternal life. It is pure life. And with the spirit life that God gave man, that God gave Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve could now have what? Relationship with holy God. Because it was God life in them. So Adam and Eve, there was no fear. There was no worry. There was no barrier. Do you sometimes feel like you can't communicate with people? You're speaking to them and you can't, they don't understand you and you don't understand them. You say something and they say, huh, why'd she say that? No, I didn't mean that I meant. So many barriers to communication, right? So many barriers. But when Adam and Eve had God life in them, there was no barrier of communication. There was perfect understanding between God and his, crea and his creation. Adam and Eve, there was perfect communication. No shyness, no this, no that. It was perfect harmony. That's how God planned for man and woman to be. That's how God planned planned for you and for me to be in relation to him as well because we are God's creation. Does that make sense? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Okay. We're still going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get finished, but we're going to get part way down this road. And it's important for us to understand that if you haven't fully understood that before. So we are body, soul, and spirit, Trinity, just as God is Trinity. And because God gave spirit life, because God gave God life to Adam and Eve, they had a relationship with him. And all was well. God gave them a home, the Garden of Eden. God gave them provision, 
the fruits and the grains. God gave them life. That was in the beginning. He gave them responsibility. Take care of the garden. And he gave them boundaries. Listen carefully because this is what God does. He gave them boundaries. What was the boundary that God gave them? Don't eat the fruit of that tree. Don't eat the fruit. God always gives boundaries. Listen, brothers and sisters. Do you sometimes, I, talk, I sometimes talk with people, they're angry at God. They're mad at God. Why does God always say no? Oh, God's always, I can't do this and I can't do that. I can't do whatever. Listen, if God gives a boundary, it's because he loves you. If God says no, it's because no is best for you in that circumstance. But you and I, because of our stubborn wills, because we, have, because we live with sin, with the perfect will, with the free will that God has given us, one of the most wonderful gifts God has ever given us, we take that free will, that power of choice, and we push through the boundary because we say, I want it anyhow. It will make me happy. I know what's best for my life. I want it anyhow. I want to do that. How many of us, every one of us, have done that in our lives? We've pushed through boundaries. We knew we shouldn't have. And what came to us in the end? Heartbreak, pain, loss, sorrow, because we pushed through the loving, protective boundaries of God. That's why he has them there. And he gave them boundaries. But what did man and woman do? We know very well. We know very well. What did they, what did they do? They said, we want to eat it. It looks good. They ate. They ate. Remember what God said? When you eat it, what will happen? You will die. You will die. What happens when they eat? Do they die? They don't seem to, do they? Because Eve talks to Adam. They're still walking around. Did God lie? God said, you'll die. The day you eat it, you'll die. What dies? The God life dies. What could relate to God dies. Because God cannot live with sin. God does not fellowship with sin. God does not have relationship with sin. And the day they ate, the God life in them, the spirit life in them died. And physically they began to die as well. Physically they began to die. They began to age at that moment. Now they would physically completely die at some point later. But at that moment they died. We come to a close this morning. We'll pick this up. Why did Jesus come 2,000 years later then? They died in the garden. And after that, every man, woman, and child born into this world, they were going to die too. But God is love. And what does God do? He sends Jesus. He sends Jesus. He sends Jesus so that you and I might have life. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. You must be born again. And who gives that new life? The Spirit. The Spirit of God. In creation, the Spirit gives life, the breath of life from God. In regeneration, when you and I come to God, when anyone comes to God, it is the Spirit of God. So we're going to close in prayer. We're not going to do the video this morning, Amy. But I want us just to close in prayer this morning. You may be a Christian this morning. You may not yet be. But the Spirit comes to work in our lives and bring life. Holy Spirit, work in our lives and in our hearts this morning. We were so far from you, but because you loved us, you would not leave us as we are. God, you didn't ch we didn't choose you first. Sometimes that's what we think. Your spirit wasn't satisfied. 
and you wooed us and you drew us until we came to you and you gave us life again. Oh God, we need your life in our lives more and more, more abundantly overflow in our lives in the dead areas of our life bring life we pray your life we pray not our life not our striving not our trying not our theological figuring and working it out but your life in our lives thank you thank you thank you for sending Jesus to us Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into our hearts to make your home in us, that we might have fellowship with you, with God, that we can communicate, that we can speak the same language, that we can live with you as you planned for us to live with you and fellowship with you and receive from you and give to you just as you planned. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for your work. We thank you for your coming. Be at home in our hearts and lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. God bless you.